Okay, how's everyone doing? I'm feeling it. Okay, this is the auditorium, and we are going to talk about no decline in dripless area. Is everybody where they're supposed to be? Anybody else with fear? You can stay anyway. Well, Ashley Cam from Iowa State University is going to present today. She is a graduate assistant, which means graduate, it means underpaid, overworked. Uh, there will be a tip drop for her later, I get half. But uh, she is where we at. Uh, she's currently working towards completing her master's degree with uh, babies in forest sustainable agriculture. She completed research as part of the project for the U.S. Forest Service on open generation management and policy tool for use on private forest land in the Griffith area. She is also currently researching opportunities in four U.S. Great Plains states for agricultural practices on marginal agricultural land for biomass production. Now, this presentation is being recorded. It'll be time to answer questions. Thanks. Right. Sorry, I'm just going to get a little feedback as I walk over here. All right. Um, so like Sharvi said, I'm, I'm going to hear, just talk a little bit about oak issues within uh, the Driftless area. Um, and so, like Sharvi said, I'm a, I'm a grad student at Iowa State. Um, I know a little bit about oak because I had the privilege of working on a, a project with Trisha Kamuj from the Wisconsin DNR as well as some other folks. Um, looking at some behavioral patterns of policy tools, uh, specifically on what's happening with oak dynamics. And so we looked at some forest inventory and analysis data. Um, we looked at some specific things that were happening happening in various ecoregions within the driftless area. Um, and, and we found some interesting stuff. Um, but I'm here today mainly to talk about the region as a whole and kind of what's going on and, and why we think it's going on and what landowners can do to encourage oak on their property, as well as um, a little bit about management tools, policy tools that can help pay for some of that, because it can be kind of expensive. Um, one of the things that you specifically are bringing to the table today is what's going on in your woodlands. Um, and, and that's important because oak management is very site specific, and it's very contextualized within the different sites. Um, and so moisture availability and topography and previous use history, current composition, current structure of your forest, all of that has a huge impact on how you can best encourage oak on your property. So we'll walk through a little bit about that today. Um, so first off, we're going to talk a little bit about history and what, what, why is oak in the region, what does it do for the region, some management trends that are causing the decline that we're seeing, and then some programs. Um, and then after the talk, I have a lot more specific information about programs that are state specific if you want to come up and grab that um, after we're done today. Um, so I just made this new slide. Some of you might have saw, seen me sneak it in. Um, one of the things, my, my advisor describes me as a policy wonk. <laughs> and so I know a lot about policy. Um, and I know a lot about social issues regarding management. Um, one of the things that I can contribute some to, but not a lot to, is very specific technical kind of rules of thumb for silver, silvicultural practices encouraging oak. Um, so when I was walking around today, um, while I was you know, drinking my pot and a half of coffee throughout the day, I found this Woodland Owner's Guide to Oak Management, which is a really awesome handout uh, that has a lot of that specific silvicultural stuff. Um, and you can find it at that second link there. The other good resource that I know of for silvicultural information um, is, is that top link there, which is the Wisconsin DNR's um, silvicultural handbook. And that has some really good information about stocking levels and seedlings ne necessary for advanced region for oak, things like that. So um, this will be posted online, but otherwise you can jot it down if you'd like to also. So the region that we're talking about today covers four different states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa. Um, it's about 20,000 square miles, um, and it, it hosts a variety of sub-eco regions within there, um, but oak is a, a dominant canopy and has been within this region for thousands of years. <laughs> and the majority of the acres, as you can see, are, are within Wisconsin. Um, it's a critical part of the history. So the area traditionally was a hardwood forest, as well as tall grass prairie, um, and so we've seen an evolution of that. Um, of different standard dynamics over time. Um, 
The Driftless area is also uh, called the Paleozoic Plateau, and so that's another name that you might have heard for it. Um, it's known for its steeper hilly slopes, um, nice trout streams, and in the bottomlands now that used to be tall grass prior are typically in agricultural production, so pasture or uh, row crops, things like that. Um, forests make up about a third of the land cover, and about half of that is described as having oak hickory dominance. Um, and about all of that, so about 90% actually, of the forest land is in private ownership, which means that the management practices that are occurring on private land have a huge impact on what we're seeing as far as oak regeneration. Um, so, ecologically, the Driftless region offers a variety of, wild, of services to wildlife because of its own component. Um, it's a foundation species in most eastern deciduous forests. Um, food and habitat, I think, are probably the big ones. Um, and 96 species of birds and mammals, as you can see up there, rely on acorns specifically as a food source. Um, the white-tailed deer, oh, love-hate relationship with that animal. We'll get to that a little bit later, particularly with oak region. Um, the corner blue butterfly is actually a species that's an insect that's endangered that relies on oak habitat. Um, and, then, and then one other interesting thing about oak is, you know, it has thick bark, which helps with fire tolerance, but also it hosts a variety of different insect species um, and other microorganisms that are actually really beneficial and integral to the ecosystem within the Driftless region. Um, so this is Pine Knob. It's a farm, um, and they have a oak savanna um, component as a part of what they do. Uh, some, some good things that I wanted to talk about just generally in the forests is that they provide a lot of really integral ecosystem services, especially within the Driftless region. So we have these really steep rolling slopes. They're gorgeous and they're forested, and they, that does a lot of good things. It helps reduce erosion so that you, know, you don't lose your, your soil down to your neighbor down the hill or down the stream. Um, it helps with aquatic habitat by putting organic matter inputs into streams, um, and then helps with water filtration. Also, um, because of its wildlife habitat contributions, uh, it, it provides a lot economically. Um, so oak is a good timber species, and so that's one economic input. And also with the wildlife habitat, it encourages deer and turkey, um, which, which utilize it heavily. And again, we'll talk more about deer later. So it's very, very important for local and state economies. Tourism for some of the trout streams within the region is also very, is very a good contribution. So, oaks are great. They do a lot of good things. They're really pretty, but they're, but they're going away in the Driftless region. Um, and this has been documented about over the last 20, 25 years. Um, and we're seeing a lot of research coming out about the fact that it's, it's a regeneration issue. We still see oak. If you walk around, you still see plenty of beautiful oak. But, but we're not seeing younger oak stands, and that's the major issue. So most of the Driftless area has consistently experienced a decline in the acreage of oak hickory forests, which means that most of it, you know, we're, we're seeing up to 16% decline in some places. And then a little bit over half of that is seeing actually an increase in the acreage of maple basswood. So while overall in the Driftless region, we're seeing an increase in forest cover, we're losing our oak component. Um, and, and really what that means is if you, if you walk out into a forest stand that has an oak component, you may have a gorgeous overstory of white oak or red oak, and, and you know, that's, that's great. But the problem is, is that those larger trees are just not being replaced. And so when you look down, you might see a lot of seedlings coming up, and you might start seeing some of that regeneration, but it's not making it into the intermediate phase and up into the overstory. It's not competing with these faster growing species, thick curvaceous layers, or all of the brush that we're starting to see within some of the forest cover in the Driftless area. So part of the reason that we're losing it is just the way that oak reproduces and the conditions that it needs in order to successfully reproduce. Um, so oak seeds are actually usually dispersed by animals. Um, so blue jays, squirrels, as well as gravity. Um, and so on the with the topography of the region, it's actually a really good thing. Um, but you're not going to get a good crop off of oaks um, 
well, you won't even get your best crops until that, that tree is about 50 to 75 years old. Um, and, and they have a, a very irregular crop release. Um, and so it could be, you might get a crop every couple of years or every 10 years. Um, Bur oaks have the, the highest rate of, of crop release, and that's usually about every two to three years. But some species, you know, like red oak, could be closer to 10 or 11 even. So when we, when we talk about how to encourage oak, we're really talking about a few different things. We need a lot of light, we need a lot of moisture, and we need to control the animals. And all of those are pretty big things. Um, and again, I would, I would refer you back to some of those resources that I mentioned earlier to look at some of the specifics as far as the, the strategies to encourage that light opening. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of that, but the specific and technical details of it, um, you'll, you'll want to check in with a consulting forester, a private forester, a DNR forester, extension forester, or other resource professional who can give you some of that specific information that works with your site and your woodlands. Um, so what can we do for poor light conditions? Well, we got we got to hack up the overstory, <laughs> and that's not pretty. It's the ugly cuts, um, and I'll show you some pictures of what I mean by that in a minute. Um, and, and what we need to do to do that is, is because if we're not getting light to the ground, these oak seedlings, they just don't have the ability to compete. And one of the, way, the reasons is they, acorns, you know, when they find their way into the mineral soil and they start to germinate, they first focus on growing a nice strong taproot and putting that down into the ground and developing a nice root structure so that it can compete against animal predation, it can compete against fire. And those are really good strategies for it. What it doesn't do well is work on that upward growth and put itself up into, you know, the mid canopy or up into some of the where some of the taller trees are. And because it's, you know, buried in shade, because it's working on its root structure, light. If it doesn't have it, it's just not going to make it. Um, another thing that's really important is looking at what's, you know, what's around it. What's it trying to grow in? If you have a really thick herbaceous layer, or even if you have a really thick litter layer, that acorn might not really have a very fighting chance. There might be um, fungal issues that it's experiencing. It could be um, just not in the conditions it needs in order to get into that mineral soil to develop its root structure. Brush management is really important. Getting, you know, buckthorn, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, all of that under control, which, trust me, I know, is a project. <laughs> Is a very serious project for, for anybody with woodlands. It, it's integral for oak success. And then coming in and, and doing intermediate treatments following intensive cuts is important. Because you can go in and you can create those light conditions and your oak seedlings like, yeah, this is great. I'm going to do it. But of course, that oak, its upward growth is going to be really slow. And so while it's working on its root structure, all of a sudden, everything else that when you did your site preparation or when you did your, your, over, you know, your overstory removal, all of that other stuff's going to be working to come up and compete with it. So you need to make sure that you're going back into the stand or re repeated to make sure that you're encouraging the region that you already have happening on your site. So here's the ugly cuts, the ugly stuff that I'm talking about. Um, and one of the best things that you can do when you are looking to manage for oak regeneration, when you're doing patch cuts, when you're doing shelter wood, when you're doing clear cuts, is connect with your, you know, a resource professional in your area, a consulting forester. Like I said, I, I don't have to go through all the types of foresters, but connect with one of them and ask them to say, you know, where has this been done in our region? Where have these sites, been, where has the, these types of management practices been completed? Can you take me there? Can you show me what they look like in the aftermath? Because, you know, when you're working to establish these beautiful oak trees on your property, and somebody says, we're going to do that. Like, oh my God, that does not look majestic. That doesn't look peaceful. It looks, it looks like a mess. Um, but over time, you know, as the system starts to bounce back, you get, you get a really gorgeous, beautiful oak component. But it does take time, and it does take patience, and it takes commitment to some of these more intensive management strategies to open up that canopy. Animals. Um, we're, we're a lot of the time specifically talking about deer when we talk about this. Um, one of the best things that you can do is um, preparing the site, reducing the layer, uh, the, the herbaceous layer or the litter layer that smaller animals might use. 
Um, it's important to maintain at least some litter layer, though, because uh, if you completely remove the little litter layer and just have mineral soil, those acorns are going to lay on top of it and dry out, and then they won't germinate at all. Um, so maintaining a, a good balance of amount of litter is important for the site. Um, when you're planting, there's a few ways you can do that. Um, single tree planting is good, and you can protect that in a variety of different ways. Direct seeding is also uh, a good way to go in and just you know, shower the site with the whatever seed you're trying to encourage, and that will hopefully, you know, you'll get some that germinate, and there's going to be an abundance of them, and so that might be a little bit of a distraction to overwhelm predators. Um, so they might not get all your trees, they might get most of them, but maybe not all of them. Um, and then, you know, going ahead and managing and encouraging the ones that are doing the best in the aftermath of that direct seeding. Um, and then doing, doing different ways of protection. Tree shelters are probably uh, the one that most people are most familiar with. And, and those can be successful in some cases, I know for a lot of um, folks that are managers, that's not their favorite. Um, but Balloons is by Cats is a new one that I'm kind of excited about that I'll tell you about. I saw this from a, a Minnesota DNR tip sheet. Um, so you take like little ordinary balloons, like water balloons, the really small, tiny, tiny ones, and you put them over a terminal bud of the tree that you're trying to encourage and protect through the dormant season. Um, because, you know, wildlife really rely on buds as well as acorns and things like that for a food source um, while they overwinter. But, you know, you don't really want them coming in after you've done a planting or you've done a direct seeding and nipping off the terminal buds on all your trees and effectively ending their growth. So you take this little balloon and you put it over the top of it and that will protect it over the winter months and then by the time you're ready to remove it in, in you know, April or May, the sunlight has actually degraded the balloon so much that when you go to remove it, it kind of just falls apart in your hand. So there's not really a, a chance of snapping that off, which there is with some other types of bud caps. So uh, it seems like a pretty, pretty cheap, pretty good way to manage any rege regeneration that you have coming up. So what does this mean? Well, it takes time. It takes act active management. Oh, it takes a lot of work. Uh, it takes multiple entries into your site and a lot of talking with other landowners, with your resource professionals, folks like that. It takes money, <laughs> and we're going to talk about that in a bit, but it takes time. Oaks are very slow-growing species, and so you want to make sure that, you know, working to encourage that, you're, you're planning in this timeline. When you, when you plan for oak, you're planning, you know, for the next 25, 50, 100, 200 meters. And so where do you even get started with that? Well, money is not growing trees. I'm sure we've all, if we found that species, we would all be growing it right now. So it doesn't. But policy has money attached to it. And that's one of the things I want to talk about today. Um, posture programs, tax programs, and technical assistance. Um, and there's a variety of different federal and state programs that have all of these three built into them or can collaborate in certain ways to ensure that landowners can access all of these. So cost sharing programs, uh, they provide both technical advice and assistance. Um, and there are, you know, some specific, when you, when you enter into a cost sharing contract, there's a lot of technical standards that might go along with it, but all of these, you know, if you are working with a forester, can they can help direct you and make sure that you're clear of what you're getting into and understand the contract and, and all of that, all of the bureaucratic stuff. Um, the good thing is it can, it can do a few things. It can alleviate the cost of specific management practices. Um, it can provide income if you're looking at conservation easements, and I'll talk about those just briefly. Um, and then it also provides access to resources as you start to, again, plan into the long term. Because when you're talking about oak, you're talking about the long term. Um, and then, like I mentioned before, some programs allow for cost sharing of multiple practices. So you can find ways that, that these programs can interact to even further alleviate some of the cost burdens. So I'm first going to go over talking about a few different federal programs. So yes, the NRCS does have programs for non-industrial private forest land uh, For some reason, we've, we've definitely heard a lot of feedback from folks that this is a surprise, but yes, Absolutely they do, and there's a variety of them. Um, so the first one, the Conservation Reserve Program, requires you to have an agricultural cropping history on your land. So it has to be, you have to have owned your land for a year, and then you have to have been cropped four out of the <coughs> six years. 
Um, and so that one is primarily targeted at looking at the establishment of newer forests. And so this could be a larger forest stand, it could be something a little bit more strategic for an environmental purpose like a riparian buffer strip or a windbreak or something like that. But they cost share um, tree establishment on your property. Uh, one of the good things about this program too is that they allow for um, what's called enduring benefits. So when your application goes through the ranking process um, and, and you say, I really want to grow trees. In fact, I want to grow a lot of trees. Your application might get bumped up a little bit higher in the process because you can't, you are more, more than likely, or more, you're not likely, sorry, to go back in and, and try to mow all that down and to corn and soybeans after the contract expires. That probably wouldn't be the best idea. Um, and so that's one of the good things about that program as far as tree planting goes. Um, and there's a few more programs that interact that have more of just a sustainable resource use and conservation focus. And so this would be the Conservation Stewardship Program, the Environmental Quality Incentive Program, and the Wildlife Habitat Incentive Program. So CSP, EQIP, and WIP is kind of their thing. Um, the Conservation Stewardship Program is really about encouraging folks to do more given what they're already doing. And so this is kind of like rewarding people who are already trying to do really good things for their land. Um, and so this is to, this incentivizes additional management practices, new management practices, um, new things that you want to do on your property that maybe you can't try without some cost sharing alleviation, some financial alleviation. Um, EQIP, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, um, as well as the Wildlife Habitat Incentives Program, they do a really cool thing where you can, you can plan out intermediate treatments from within your application. So what this means is that if, if you have an oak component that um, you want to preserve and you want to protect into the long term, uh, you can apply for them and say, I want to do this larger thinning or I want to do a patch cut or I want to do a clear cut. And then you can also, within the same application, plan for a few of those intermediate treatments as well. And so the, all of that would be included in one application. So what's that, what that's doing is ensuring that you might have some, some elite financial alleviation when you want to go back in and do another thinning or do some other protective work to help reduce the competition that's, that's happening on your land while that work is getting established and working its way up into the story. And then the Forest Legacy Program and the Forest Stewardship Program are also really good programs. Um, they're more specific to uh, forests. They don't, they, they don't really interact with agriculture or anything like that, whereas the other two have a lot more of an agricultural component or even opportunities for agricultural producers as well. Um, the Forest Legacy Program actually cost shares or can provide some degree of financial alleviation for the establishment of um, permanent conservation easements on somebody's property. And so what that means is you're, you're giving over certain rights of, on your land to another organization. And this could be a state organization um, or a local nonprofit, a state nonprofit, or even a federal <laughs> nonprofit. Um, and a lot of the times FLP will help provide some some financial assistance as you move through the legal process of establishing that. And then the Forest Stewardship Program, kind of like the Conservation Stewardship Program, rewards folks who are already trying to do good things for their property. And so if you do have a resource concern and you want to try a new project to promote, you know, habitat or anything like that on your property, they'll help to provide cost sharing through that. So the state cost share programs, um, there's, there's one in each state, and each of these provide cost share assistance between 50 to 75%, depending on the state and depending on the program. Um, all of them have what's called, what's called practice contracts, and the federal program has that too. Um, so when, when you go in and you, you say, this is really what I want to do on my property, I'm committed, you know, I've, I've figured out what exactly I need to do silviculturally to make that happen. 
I qualify in all the ways I need to qualify, I'm eligible. Um, they say, okay, great. We're going to give you the money, but then you have to maintain these practices given these X, Y, and Z technical standards for the next 10 years or the next 20 years. So it depends on the program, what, how long their contract length is going to be. Um, for the federal program, sometimes they have built in, federal programs, they sometimes have built in where they can give you financial assistance to help complete some of those maintenance practices. Like I said, with EQIP for the duration of the, the, the kind of span of the practice, the practice lifespan. And again, it's usually about 10 years, some of them are 20 years, depending on the practice. Um, and so then with the state cost share programs, most of them require you to keep um, that practice, to maintain that practice that they initially cost share um, at your own expense for the duration of your contract. And so that's, again, typically about 10 years to 20 years, depending on which program and which state, and even which practice you're looking at. Because some of them that are more intensive might have longer contracts. So, the, the benefits that come with the state tax programs, they provide, or I'm sorry, I was talking about cost share programs. So with tax programs, uh, they provide more just overall financial relief. Um, and I have a bunch of handouts that I'm gonna have you come up and grab afterwards that have a lot of information in here about what the specific parameters of each of these are. Um, I, ha I spent a lot of fun time digging through, uh, digging through code, tax code, and figuring out what all of those were. So I will welcome you to come up and take those when I'm done. Um, they often require a force management plan, and then sometimes they have additional requirements. So with a few programs, not only do you have to have a current forest management plan, sometimes it has to be by a certified technical provider that's certified through the DNR, but then some of them require you even to complete the activities that are outlined in your management plan in order to stay enrolled in the program. So again, that depends on the program, and um, I'll, I'll go through all of that information. Okay, so this is a, this is a graph. Can everybody read this? Right the back. I don't know how hard it is to read back there. Kind of? Okay. Uh, so this, this is a table that just kind of shows, in a nutshell, which programs require what. And so I'll tell you about the categories. <laughs> but we have up here is the Wisconsin Managed Forest Law. Here is SFIA, and that's in Minnesota. <coughs> C, which is also in Minnesota. Forest Reserve. And the FDA Tax Incentive down here. Um, and so what each of these means, ownership size is requirements for programs that stipulate acreage. So minimum acreage, maximum acreage that you need to have in order to enroll in the program. Use specifications includes things like you're not allowed to economically profit from the sale of timber, or um, you have to exclude livestock, or uh, you, can't have, you, you can't have anybody lease hunting on your property at that time. Um, requirements for public access. Sometimes they might say you have to have a public access component um, or structural development. So they might say you can't have a house, you can't have a maintenance building, or will, it's either or you're not eligible or sometimes they'll take off like an acre or two acres depending on how big the building is. Um, timber production goal. So within this category, um, this specifies that you, you might have to have a focus for timber production as one of your goals in order to be eligible for that program. Stand conditions, that just means that you have to have a certain amount of species composition um, and trees per acre in order to maintain your enrollment in that program. Management plan, just means you have to have a management plan. Again, it's um, most likely done by a cert certified professional and the DNR usually stipulates who those folks are in order to be enrolled in the program. The only one you don't have to have one in right now is Iowa. Um, and then contract lengths include minimum or maximum amounts of, of enrollment. Um, and what that, what that typically means is that some of these, you, you don't have to enter into a contract. You don't have to sign anything. You just enroll through your assessor's office. And then as long as you're meeting kind of all of these other conditions that they specify, you're just auto re-enrolled every year. And you might have somebody who comes out and does a property audit to make sure you 
actually still have a forest there for the property that you're getting tax benefits on. Um, but as long as you do that, you're auto enrolled. But for these others, it's a, it's a contract basis. Um, and then ownership transfer, that just means that if, if you sell your property, the tax benefits transfer to the new owner. And so you don't have to go through any legal loopholes to try to kind of get them re-signed up or anything like that. So that'll just move along with whoever, whoever buys your property. All right, so I want to go through each of these kind of briefly, tell you a little bit about uh, some of the good stuff that you might get. So Wisconsin Managed Forest Law, um, they pay an acreage share tax, and this is instead of just regular property taxes. So this depends on whether you have it as open access to the public or whether you have it as closed. Um, and so what this is going to do is just reduce your taxes overall. Uh, Minnesota, they will pay you an annual payment. This is SFIA. They have two different ones. That SFIA will actually give you an annual payment. Um, and interesting thing about this one is that their process, whereas the last one, you just have to have a management plan, and then the certified plan writer that writes your plan will submit the application to the district forester for approval. In Minnesota, in Minnesota for SFIA, you have to file a covenant. And I'm not going to get into the huge process because, you know, Minnesota is technically not one of our three states. But um, if you, if you want to come up here and check it out and read a little bit about what that means, I, it's on the information for, for Minnesota up here. Um, but you have to file a covenant with the county recorder's office um, for the property to be enrolled. And, and then you get to do this fun bureaucratic thing where you just sit around and wait two or three months. And that's actually what their website says happens. So you sit around for two or three months and you're like, wait for it to process. And then um, you apply with the Minnesota Department of Natural, uh, of, or sorry, the Minnesota Department of Revenue. And they can, you, you can either do that online or on paper for SFIA benefits. Um, and then they'll let you know, again, I don't know how long, but eventually they'll let you know whether or not you're approved for that program. Um, so 2C, which is the other tax program in Minnesota, uh, that's just a, a, a reduction. You just have to have a management plan and then submit that to the local county assessor. Iowa, easiest process of all of them. You get tax exemption, which is exciting. Uh, and you just contact your local county assessor. They'll come out, check out your property, and enroll. Um, and then Illinois, this is a tax reduction. Um, and you get an approved management plan from a technical service provider. And so again, you'll want to check with the IOD and R to make sure you're getting your plan done by somebody that they say is certified, because otherwise it's not going to count. Um, and then you can contact your local county assessor and the will kind of get you connected with that. So, using multiple programs, um, I highly, highly, highly encourage this because even though it's really going to feel like a lot of paperwork and a lot of talking to the government and a lot of talking to a resource professional, the more you do that and the more opportunities you see, the less money you're going to have to pay out of pocket to do some of this, this planning for general course management or specifically if you're, if you're here to get excited about what I'm here to get excited about. Oh! Um, so the good news is, is that Oak is slow, which means you have so much time to use a variety of different programs for your benefit. So car share programs sometimes permit dual enrollment. Um, and so what that means is that I could potentially be enrolled in a program in Illinois for a cost share, as well as be enrolled in a federal program at the same time, and they will both offer cost sharing on the same practice in order for me to get full financial alleviation of what I'm trying to do. Now, they won't give you, they won't pay out anything over 100%, um, but, they, but they will work with you to make sure that you're getting the most benefits that you can get. Um, you can also enroll subsequent to another program contract. Um, so a few different ways that this can happen is, say, you know, say you, you go out and you use one program uh, to establish a, a nice, you know, old woodland on your property, or you do a clear cut or something like that to get the process started. Well, oak is really slow, so your contract is probably going to last by the time you might see any real movement or momentum in the growth of that stand that's coming up in the aftermath of that intensive cut. Um, and so 
what you can do is then enroll in a program following that. Again, sometimes you're going to have to check on this before you decide to make this your plan of action to make sure that the program permit, parameters permit this. Um, but then you can enroll after the, your first contract has lapsed with a new program in order to make sure that you're maintaining the health of that oak resource. And for a lot of the states, well, for Minnesota and Wisconsin, oak is seen as a priority um, ecologically for, for a variety of different agencies that are doing cost sharing. Um, and so again, you'll, you're, you're likely to see a higher priority in your ranking with your applications when you do that as well. And then some programs can really interact to support each other. So say I have, you know, Wisconsin, uh, so Wiggle Gap, the Wisconsin Land and Earth Forest Grant Program, cost share um, a forest management plan for me because, you know, those can be expensive. So I have somebody who completes a forest management plan for me and I have them cost share that. Well, my forester might then say, let's use this plan and implement some of these practices in this other cost sharing program that can cost share some of these specific on the ground cuts that you want to do or site prep or anything like that. And so these programs can really work to support each other. And so connecting, you know, with somebody from the NRCS, Andrew Forrester, and some other folks to see what are the options out there is a really good way to make sure you're getting, again, the most bang for your buck. And I just talked about that. Okay, so the bad news is, is that oak, oak is slow. It's a good thing and it's a bad thing. So management takes research. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of diligence. And particularly, if you want to dive in and do all this work to make sure you're getting a lot of cost sharing, it, it takes a lot of writing. It takes a lot of understanding, you know, some of these bureaucratic processes. But the good thing is, is that you have resource professionals who are there to walk you through it, to explain everything, to make sure that you understand, you know, the stipulations and the technical standards that, that you need to honor in order to participate in these programs. And, and from the folks that I've met and the folks that I've talked to that are doing oak regeneration efforts on their land, they, they said that their resource professionals were phenomenal and, and really key in them make, guiding them through these processes and making it really easy and really fluid. Because sometimes, you know, if you are using multiple programs in order to, um, to you know, get what you want on your property and to manage specifically for oak, they can help you navigate a variety of different resources, help you fill out those applications and get them sent off so that they can really kind of keep the process really smooth for you. And you use multiple resources. Talk to other landowners. Look at tree-based NGOs. Talk to your NCS workers. But again, your district forester is always probably going to be a good, a good contact. Or local consulting foresters or other folks that um, are recognized with, with good credentials. I'll encourage that. So where do you start? Again, connecting with all of these different people. And the, the difficulty about oak regeneration is that there, there just isn't one solid recipe for making it happen. You know, all of the different practices, you know, that, it, that exist out there from, you know, to, to encourage it, all of the intensive cuts. The only thing that you can do is, is try your hardest and, and make sure that you're connecting with people to, to really see what the best option is for your property. Because if you're managing for habitat for wildlife, or you know, if you just want oak for its aesthetic value, if you want it for timber, um, all of those different management goals that you have are going to, and how that's going to happen is going to depend on your site conditions, you know, the moisture, your light availability, your aspect, the topography, your use history, all of those kinds of things. And so you really want to make sure that you're, you're capturing all of your opportunity by connecting with all these other folks. Cost share programs and tax programs can really help alleviate a lot of those expenses. But again, oak requires a lot of persistence and a lot of dedication and a lot of digging in and figuring out kind of what's going on at the policy level, but also silviculturally because practice standards are changing all the time. Ah, so some folks that I want to thank, and then I want to invite you to grab some handouts have some conversations. I want to listen. I want to hear a little bit about if any of you have managed to run your property. You know what you've done, how that's worked, things like that. Um, so first off, I'll open it up for questions before I start asking you a bunch of questions. Yeah. Uh, you haven't mentioned much about fire on the land for oak regeneration. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk a bit about it? Yeah, I can talk about fire. So, I am very pro fire, especially when it comes to oak. Oak is, is naturally, it's naturally based in the landscape that saw a lot of repeated fire disturbance. Um, the problem that we're coming up against now, and the reason, one of the reasons that oak is having a region issue is because we have completely removed fire from the landscape. And so that's one of the reasons a lot of these intensive silvicultural cuts are kind of going in and trying to mirror, on a more basic level, what might be happening with fire. When you're using fire as a management tool in the driftless area, it can get a little complicated. Um, and the reason that is is because we're, you can be butting up against a lot of urban infrastructure, a lot of other different types of land uses. You might have adjacent roads. But the main, the main challenge is managing for fire on steep topography. Um, and be, that's because the air conditions and the moisture conditions and all of that can, can change in a second. And so if you are doing larger scale burns within a, a steeper slope or, you know, within a variable slope up and down a hill or, you know, anything like that, it's tricky. And, and a lot of resource professionals that, that we've talked to, that I talked to through my research say, we would love to do it. We do love to do it when we can figure out that yes, absolutely, there's a way to do it. But you know, sometimes, sometimes you just can't. And some of these programs see that as, as too much of a burden. So I know that for for site preparation or for um, kind of some intermediate disturbance, some of these programs will cost share prescribed fire. Um, some of the state, a lot more of the state programs, and I know specifically WIPLGAP, the Wisconsin Forest Land Under Grant Program won't cost you that. And again, it's just because it's something that they they just don't see. They, they see other other ways to do it that is more of a, a risk minimization. Um, I know that I've, I've heard a lot of other people say that they don't want to run wood, fire through their woodlands because of how unpredictable it can be. Um, and they don't want to damage residual trees. If you're running fire through something that you are managing for timber, no matter how hard you're, you're, you're working at that fire, there's probably going to be at least some degree of, of, of scarring on that. And so I know that fire, again, depending on your objectives, is a very, very effective tool. But again, you have to work with your resource professionals to see if, if it's something that they feel that they can do on your property. Um, and, and, and to see, again, if, if you want it cost shared, that's going to be, again, a little bit more of a, a loophole policy-wise. How many of you have oak forests? Okay. How many of you how many of you have ever done management practices on your property specifically to encourage oak? Oh good, a lot of you. That's really exciting. Of course, I should have assumed that this group has done some of that. Um, and so have any of you ever used some of these some of these um, tools or strategies? Like did you do larger scale clear cuts or kind of what how did that work out for you? Yeah. <clears throat> Two years ago, or three years ago, um, we cleared cut mm -hmm. and, and planted uh, swamp white, gray oak, fir oak, um, walnut in there. Uh, of course, then the following year, we did the drought. And I lost one third of my planting, so I went back and replanted. And to work with the deer, um, I planted also some larger trees that I put in uh, tree shelters, mm -hmm. but um, sprayed with plant shit twice a year to um, keep down the deer grass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it worked good last summer. I would wait to see the spring how it did during the winter. Um, but then, now I will be at the point that I have to go back in and cut down the competing vegetation. Mm -hmm. Um, and spray that. Yeah, it's a lot of work, and I, you're not the first person that I've heard say that they've had issues because of the drought. I know that just for any tree planting establishment right now, that's, that's been a huge factor. Yeah, we actually to couple in with the drought and um, herbaceous plants growing up around for competition. Even planting in the forested areas, it seems kind of crazy to bring out buckets of mulch. But when we're planting the root production management trees. There's a nice RPM trees, about four to six feet tall. Sometimes, if you're lucky, they're six. 
but we'll mold around them and give them a two foot grace mm -hmm. and it knocks back the weeds an entire lot and during drought season it really does hold in the moisture there but we don't do it any thicker than that because you don't want all the fine roots to filter just up to the top of the soil but that helps out a lot and you don't have to go in so often and check it out and see if you know they're uprooting themselves because there's no moisture in there. That's a good yeah. About 10 years ago, we bought a farm that had a permanent pasture that had been an oak savanna way back. It had trees, maybe not quite that magnificent, but a lot of red oak, white oak, and burr oak that were up in that category, close to it. And uh, a couple of particularly good stands of it. And so the problem was you, could, you couldn't really hardly see it when we bought it because it had so many uh, cedar and elm and other kinds of trees. So we removed about 500 trees to try to get it back to a savanna. We figured in our lifetime we wouldn't be able to grow a savanna. You know, yeah. it has mature trees and they're they're there. You just have to free you know free them up. So yeah. get rid of the uh, other stuff. It, and then it, we started burning. Mm -hmm. We burned like three years now through it. Some of the areas that were more open and grassy. Um, you know, it killed, the, it looked like it burned off the young oak trees, but they're very persistent. They come back each year. The bigger problem has gotten to be the deer. And so uh, for a while we planted and transplanted from other locations on the farm, some burr oak and so forth out into our savanna area. But then I, I realized last year that I have them there. It's just the deer keep eating them off every year. So what I, what I did last year then is just uh, put tree shelters on them. And so I figure if I can get them five feet above or higher above the deer, I don't really have to plant anything in there because there's a lot of young oaks starting in there. It's just they don't get a chance to become anything more than a shrub unless you protect them from the deer. Yeah. And I've used plant skid too, like this gentleman here. Mm -hmm. And I've had I've sprayed more frequently than that in the summer months, but uh, I've had pretty good success with it. And uh, but I probably spray like five times a year yeah. total. And savanna management, I know, is a whole other ball game. I'm not sure if you, you in the back there said, but he was talking a little bit about uh, managing for, for savanna. It's 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 a daunting task, and, and fire definitely, if you're if you're doing savanna management, is a key strategy in managing is in managing that type of a landscape. And I know per, particularly. Uh, Savannah, Savannah is a one place in my heart just because it's, it's one of the most degraded ecosystems, you know, across the Midwest. I mean, we just we don't have them, you know, they've been cut down and planted around and things like that. And so I, I'm always excited when I hear about Savannah restoration opportunities. Yeah. Yeah, last couple of years I've been on the third cut, pinched the trees and grew the trees. And, you know, on a five acre patch, I might have a tree of the whole five acres. Mm -hmm. But it's full of multi flower growth. It, it will be when you're when you're looking at regeneration, so moving into the next phase of, it, of the stand. If you want to, yeah, I would say if they're, I mean, if they're getting to the point where the it's just like the leafing system is just the bowl has multiflora rows under it, that probably won't be an issue yet. But when those smaller trees start to work their way up into the overstory and you want to manage them for crop relief and for bringing in an even younger understory, if you want to keep regenerating oak, you're going to want to get that multiflora rose under control. Otherwise, I mean, it's just going to overwhelm that site and take over. It's, it's definitely a species that within that type of uh, an understory landscape. Yeah, it'll, it'll help it, but if you're going to do treatments to open up the understory, it's going to help. Uh -huh. they, they, yeah, I mean, the good thing is, is that you can manage for their survival and as long as you're working to maintain the light conditions that it needs and protecting against browse, they have a pretty good fighting chance. And I would say checking in with your forester to see, you know, a, a, if there's any other constraints on your site, like if there's any other invasives that they flag, is this is going to be a problem, or moisture condition issues and how you can mitigate those would be a good option. Um, so it looks like we're kind of getting close to 
time. I can take some more questions, but for those of you who are like slowly vacating the area, if you want to come up here um, and grab some information about the different tax programs, uh, there's one for tax programs just generally, and then I have federal um, and state program handouts here for the different cost share programs in each of the four states that I was talking about. So thank you guys so much for being here today.